Hello. So this is the second video about Linton Kwesi Johnson's The Great Insurrection. And let's start by just listening to the beginning of the poem. Okay, so before we get into the main act, I just briefly wanted to mention this interesting pamphlet I met um, that I found. Um, it's it was published by the Riot Not to Work Collective about a year after the Brixton uprisings. Um, it seems to be a bunch of white anarchists. It includes this poem. Um, I don't know much about the context of this publication, but I thought the poem was an interesting counterpoint to Johnson's poem, uh, particularly these last bits. It's not youth or unemployment or immigration or even alienation like sniffing glue. It's something to do. No one is behind it or leading it. The state only just outflanked it. We all played a part in it and I'll never forget it. I mean to say, dull, it wasn't. So that last bit, maybe some kind of resonance with Johnson's poem, the kind of excitement, the celebration of events, um, possibly also some differences of approaches here. So this poem trying to say very unequivocally, as straightforwardly as possible, no one is behind it or leading it. Um, maybe kind of as a point of anarchist principle even here. And it's interesting that in one of the accounts, so this is partly an interesting publication because it includes a bunch of first person accounts of the Brixton uprisings. And in one of those accounts, uh, we hear how on the Sunday, self-appointed community leaders and the left who had come to organize us into their dead parties, slimy fronts and so on, to add insult to our police inflicted injuries. So here is a anarchist on the left who is not too happy about their um, socialist leftists um, showing up on the scene and from their perspective, trying to kind of co-opt or appropriate these events for their own um, political work. Um, so yeah, just a interesting bit of context that you can, the PDF is all online if you feel like checking it out. Um, but let's move on to Johnson's poem, The Great Insurrection. And what I'm gonna do is just go through like maybe agonizingly slowly and pick up on points that seem interesting and pose some questions. Um, I should say this is part of a, a series of videos that's about close reading. So we're primarily thinking about the, the words themselves. Although in the earlier video, I set out a, a little bit of the historical context because I think it's important. Um, so what happens? Well, we set the scene, it's April, 1981. And one of the first really interesting words that we encounter is ghetto, the ghetto of Brixton. So it's a, a, a rich and complex word, ghetto, often quite a negative word um, with connotations of poverty and segregation. Um, as, as, a, as a kind of fairly literal definition, a, a, a ghetto is a urban enclave which who, whose inhabitants are um, maybe ethnically homogenous and of an ethnicity that is not the majority of the city. In the UK, those sorts of places don't really, really exist in quite the same way. What If we think of a place like Brixton as um, exemplary, rather than there being um, a particular minority that is a majority in that enclave, it's a, it's a question of kind of diversity, that there is um, a majority of lots of lots and lots of different minorities. So it's um, a, a kind of diverse place. And that's one of the ways in which 
um, the word ghetto might have a, a positive energy about it as well. Um, it might be a reclaimed word to some extent. It might be um, a word that to somebody belonging to, to these communities means home, um, means a place of connectivity, of community, a place of protection from um, some of the injustices that might be encountered in the society more widely. Um, and I think those those positive connotations, I think, are, are what are active in this poem. Uh, as, as we continue to read on, we find like a lot of celebration, a lot of revelry, a lot of enjoyment and delight. Um, we might want to ask, you know, why and how, how does that tone of delight and celebration fit in with the other things that are going on in the poem? Uh, if we look a little bit later on, we see the ghetto grapevine is mentioned. And again, grapevine obviously is another one of those words that has like quite interestingly mixed connotations. So on the one hand, what kind of information do you get on the grapevine? Um, you know, you get rumor, you get um, hearsay, you get information that's secondhand, third hand, you get that kind of broken telephone effect where um, somebody tells something and they um, slightly mishear it or they slightly misinterpret it or they kind of add their own spin and all those incremental transformations kind of add up and add up until um, that you get this kind of completely mutated different version of what happened so that's one side of it but on the other hand the grapevine is also the place that you go to for the really good information for the information that you're not going to find in um, more kind of mainstream um, widely accessible public venues the information that is you know that that, that for, for whatever reasons people want to keep to themselves maybe because it's incriminating information maybe because it's valuable information maybe because it's potentially dangerous information that could be weaponized in some kind of way um so um in conjunction with the word ghetto i think there's also maybe a sense of something quite uh uh fruitful and vibrant and um flourishing there it's certainly um you know gr grapes you, you might associate with feasts and and festivity and wine um and uh in the context of this poem i think it's it's an interesting word choice there's some interesting connotations um given the the kind of economic deprivation prior to the Brixton uprising and given the, the economic damage um, which occurred during the uprising, um, there's a kind of pros prosperity and, and fruitfulness there. So let's go back again a little bit um, to the start. The Great Insurrection and that title itself is incredibly important. So the poet has, Linton Crozy Johnson has named this, named this event, and they've named it the Great Insurrection. Well, what kind of a title is that? What kind of name is that? What do you think? Um, it's a grand name. It's a, a, a powerful, important name with a certain amount of gravitas, dignity, grandeur. He could be being sarcastic something worth exploring we should always explore possibilities of sarcasm um humor within a poem in this case i don't think he is i think he's quite sincerely conveying an aura of importance and, and grandness um, and likewise with the epithet historical occasion um, i think he really means it so you can say that as kind of a platitude, right? So, oh, it was a historical occasion. Um, yeah, it was the event of the year. Yeah, 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 it was great. Oh, I wish I'd been there. I think there's a little bit more, more to this. Um, I think this poem is probably quite aware of the double-edged nature of entering into history. So what does it mean to become a historical event, to become, um, to become the subject of, of those who make history? Historians, of course, but others as well. Well, by controlling the past, to some extent, you have more control over the present and over the future. And so the past is a kind of valuable 
commodity which is struggled over and it's a struggle in which powerful forces often prevail. So upon entering history, you may find that your own version of events, your own memories, your own, what you think of as your own personal history suddenly becomes the property of forces that are much larger than you and that may have agendas that are um, inimical to your own interests. Um, you know, I think there's sim a similar set of um, dynamics around celebrity, around the kind of double-edged nature of celebrity, that it's something that a lot of, of people want. And then when they get it, they realize that there's certain kinds of um, agency that they expected that they would have that actually they lose. Um, so it was a historical occasion, and it was a great insurrection. He doesn't call it the Brixton uprisings. He doesn't call it the Brixton riots. Does he use the word riot at all? That's interesting. He does. He, I think he uses it twice. But he uses it in a very particular way. He uses it as part of the collocation run riot. So a collocation is when two or more words often show up together. Uh, wreak havoc is another good example. Um, and I don't know. It, it, what do you think about run riot? How how are the implications? How is the nuance different from saying when we rioted all over Brixton? Um, you might disagree, but to to my ear, it sounds it sounds more fun. It sounds more celebratory. Um, it sounds like the emphasis is on the the chaos and the haphazardness of it, um, on the on the lawlessness of it. Um, and it's a little bit softer. Um, you might talk about, uh, you know, unruly children running riot. Um, there's much more of a kind of a, a party atmosphere. Um, that said, the kind of predominant associations of rioting, given the context of this poem, they are probably what dominate. So smashing things up. Okay. So he sets up, it was 90, it was April 1981, and he sets up very clearly the causes, or the one cause um, that he sets up of these events, and that is the friction caused by the police. The police brought this about. Babylon, as we mentioned in the earlier video, is a a really rich, interesting word that includes connotations wider than the police. It includes oppressive, oppressive systems more generally, the state, um, colonialism, racism. Um, but it's clear that that this is the source of these events. So that comes right up front, and the order in which things occur is important as well. Now, what do you think about, I wish I had been there? What does it mean not to have been there? Apart from regret, remorse, FOMO. How might that calibrate the expectations of those who are listening to this poem? If the people who are listening to this poem were there, how willing and in what ways are they willing to, to listen to, to what somebody has to say about these events if that person wasn't there? So that's one set of questions. And then a related set of questions are, how might the poet anticipate those expectations, that kind of resistance from those who were there? So I don't know, I don't know if those questions are, are completely clear. To, to put it another way, as, as we keep reading through this poem, I think um, we should be attentive to how the poet is positioning themselves in relation to these events and how the poet is claiming a certain kind of legitimacy or authority to speak about these events. So already I think we can see that in action. The, the poet is quite charmingly perhaps saying how much they regret not being there and they're being really upfront about that. 
And then what pronoun is the poet using? I wish I'd been there. The poet starts to use the pronoun we. So the poet is aligning himself absolutely with um, those who, who run riot all over Brixton. Um, slightly riskily, perhaps, to make a kind of public, uh, to make a, a, a public statement that shows solidarity with criminal acts. And at the same time, the poet is very definitely identifying, prioritizing certain targets as kind of the enemy. The police vans, Swamp 81, that's the um, police operation, the stop and search operation that was um, instrumental in, in really kind of raising tensions in the weeks prior to the uprising. And the poet is also very definitely um, kind of confirming a, a sort of underlying motive, a, a message that the uprising sends, make them understand that we're not going to take any more of their oppression. So who is this we? There are different ways that you could interpret it, and that, that might be interesting. Um, the we could be people who live in Brixton, the we could be African Caribbeans, the we could be people who um, can can speak Jamaican patois. I think the we perhaps that this poem gives us above all is is the we that will not take any more oppression. So in these early parts of the poem, a speaker has really kind of started to, to establish the place from which they're speaking. And then what happens next? After we've used this pronoun, we switch to another one. The poet becomes I again for a little bit. The I, and what does the I do? The I goes around trying to find out everything that they can find out. Speaking to who? Speaking to rebels, not rioters, rebels. So there's a important word choice there. And the word rebel is linked sonically with the word revel. These words kind of resemble each other and they're put close together and that's no coincidence. So there's, um, I think there's actually a larger question in this poem about the relationship between rebellion and revelry. What does it mean to revel? It's kind of a hard term to translate. Um, it means something like, um, or, or a hard term to paraphrase, a, a hard term to find a perfect synonym for, but it, you know, it definitely means to, to take delight in something, to really, really enjoy something, um, to kind of maybe intensely fixate on it and, and to really drink up the enjoyment from it. You kind of roll around in it, um, you dwell in it. Um, it's a kind of refusal to allow something to just disappear and, and drift away. Um, you're really kind of holding on to something for the pleasure that it can um, impart to you. And you know what it's like when somebody is reveling in telling a story. Uh, they're not just communicating information. The storytelling is part of it. The storytelling is part of the, um, the, the storytelling is a source of, of extreme enjoyment. Um, and what does it mean? What, what does that mean if, if storytelling is kind of shot through with pleasure like that? What does it mean for the reliability of the information? What else does it mean? Um, what kind of audience do you think the poet is for these people that he's talking to? Is he an appreciative audience? Um, I think I think that he is. I think that he's appreciative, and I think he is probably listening with a, a great deal of pride. I don't think he's kind of sitting there saying like, "Oh no, that sounds like uh, that's not how I would have done things." Or, um, oh, I think you went too far there. Or like, oh, that must be an exaggeration. It's not a kind of um, fact-checking um, audience. It's not a kind of uh, sceptical audience. I might take that back a little bit. It's, not, it's certainly not a um, conspicuously sceptical audience. But I do think that it's a very vigilant audience. So 
this position that the poet has, partly as an outsider, right? Somebody who wasn't there, but also as somebody who's well connected, somebody who knows how to check out the grapevine. Um, this position is somebody who is kind of on, in some ways marginal and in some ways central to the situation is a kind of investigator figure, a kind of detective figure, a sleuth figure. Um, it's quite common in crime and mystery fiction, for example, for um, a figure like this to have these qualities of being in some ways separate, but in some ways really embedded in the heart of what's going on. Um, and are there certain types of perspective that are actually easier to come by as, as a partial outsider? with some degree of some sort of independence. And how does that independence compare with a completely different kind of independence, the putative independence that we encounter later on in the poem when we hear about Skarman, um, the, the judge who ended up who who headed up the independent um, inquiry of these events, independent, uh, perhaps disconnected, um, and of course not independent of the, the wider society in which these events unfolded. Um, so in this kind of middle section of the poem, the the speaker, the poet, is going around listening to people talking about um, what happened and, and piecing together this story. And these are these are good stories. These are good, exciting stories, and, and the people enjoy telling them. And I think the poet enjoys listening to them and is kind of excited and, and proud of them. And um, that's my reading of of the tone here. And there's an interesting question, I think, about um, uh, f f uh, boasting and bragging. And I think some people might have, might be tempted to think if somebody is boasting about something, then that means that they are a liar. Um, if somebody is bragging about something, then that means that they um, didn't do the things that they're saying. And I think there's like a a quite rich tradition of literature and culture, including this poem, which questions that assumption. Um, the relationship of, of, of bragging and boasting to deeds of valor is actually a little bit more complicated than that. Um, and sometimes, you know, there's such a thing as bragging rights um, sometimes the, the motivation to do something is to be able to tell the story afterwards. So sometimes the kind of potential future narrative actually shapes unfolding events in the, in the present moment. Um, and I think that's one of the, one of the ways in which this, this poem also kind of intersects a larger, um, poetic, literary, and cultural tradition, which explores the re relationship between, um, you know, uh, between violent conflict and revelry, celebration, um, which is a, a complicated, a very complicated relationship. Um, you know, uh, <laughs> from Ovid's uh, Centauromachy, in which um, you know this 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 drunken wedding kind of erupts into um, violent chaos, to um, the Red Wedding in um, Game of Thrones and beyond. There is this uneasy relationship between um, times of celebration and times of war. We, we sometimes might want to think of them as being kind of segregated and separate, but they are um, uncomfortably interwoven. Um, and 
one of the questions that this poem raises is that I think of a kind of military um, vigilance, being alert, um, This is a poem of celebration. It is a poem celebrating these events and it needs to celebrate these events. It can't not celebrate these events. Um, it doesn't have the right to not celebrate them, partly because I think the poet wasn't there. It needs to be very clear. It wants to celebrate them as well, I think, but it also needs to. It needs to as part of its own project of constructing its authority, constructing a legitimate place from which to speak. And why does it want to construct a legitimate place from which to speak? Because it wants to make some criticisms. 